Welcome to Payoff Pitch, the Action Network's newest baseball betting podcast. I'm senior editor Colin Whitchurch. We're going to be coming to you every Tuesday and Friday during the Major League season, breaking down that day's slate. I'm joined today by Action Network senior writer Sean Zarillo. So let's dive right into it. We're going to talk about all of the top matchups of the day, other games of interest, and best bets of the day. We're going to start today with the matchup of the Mets and the Phillies, 6.45 p.m. Eastern time. We got Tyler McGill against Zach Wheeler. Phillies are minus 162 favorites. Mets plus 136 underdogs with a total of eight and a half. This is a great NL East division rival. Two teams gunning for for the playoffs, for the divisional title. And they had a crazy game last night with the, the Phillies coming from behind for the win. Zerillo, what do you think about Mets versus Phillies? Yeah, just so everybody knows, I didn't put this game first on the docket. This was all Colin. So not my homerism taking over here. But I have the Mets projected around 130 for the game, 133 for the first five innings. Bet them over 140 at both numbers last night, and the numbers have come down. Would be a bit concerned about the Mets full game just because Taiwan Walker came out early last night, and then the Mets bullpen ended up blowing it. So that bullpen might be a little overworked. But Tyler McGill is a guy to watch going forward. Fastball velocity in his first start was up from 94.7 to 95.9. That would have put him in the top 10 among starters last year. And his changeup was up from, I believe, 85.5 to close to 90 miles an hour. That would have been a top five changeup on average velocity last year, up with like Garrett Cole and Luis Castillo. So this kid's throwing really hard. He struggled against lefties last year, had like a 9.95 OPS allowed against them. That remains something to watch going forward. I don't really see value in the number as it is currently, but the reason why I liked it, Zach Wheeler didn't have any spring starts and he was dealing with shoulder soreness. So you can't tell me he's 100% going into this game. I doubt he's going to go six innings. Uh, Probably would assume like 80 pitches or something in this start. I mean, he was great. He had a 2.77 XERA last year, was probably the second best pitcher in baseball behind Corbin Burns. And if Burns wasn't in the NL, he would have won the Cy Young. So... I mean, Scherzer might have won it as well. But Wheeler, I, I just can't imagine he's 100% for this start. And having no spring starts to even get stretched out for this is pretty concerning. Yeah, it, that's interesting. I actually didn't realize this was Wheeler's first start of the season that they held him back. Because when I first saw this line, my inkling was to go on the total. Because I'm with you. I like McGill. I think he's the real deal. And with Wheeler's track record, I thought eight and a half. I think you can even find some nines out there. Um, or even the first first half because as you mentioned the Mets bullpen troubles and the Phillies general overall bullpen troubles um first half total of four and a half um I was thinking going under there does the total scare you a little bit too much just given Wheeler's uh question marks with with his coming back from a spring injury I didn't actually check the weather dinner today Citizens Bank Park is one of the one of the parks where when the wind is blowing out it has a pretty substantial effect um I would not touch the, any sort of full game under, that's for sure. Um, I think I have I have the first five. I have the full game total at 8.8, and I have the first five total at 4.6. So it's not a play for me. Uh, it's just there's too much unknown with Wheeler today. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I think I'm probably going to go under there. Um, Mets-Phillies games just, you know, uh, generally tend to, to, to be low scoring early. Um, I'm going to trust that that – Wheeler knows his body and is good to go. I'm a McGill believer. So I would say um, for me personally, I'm going to recommend an under on the under four and a half on the first five innings. Um, But it's an interesting matchup. Um, Obviously both these teams trying to get a lot of momentum early on. I feel like if you just hit the live over in every Mets Phillies game for like the past year, you would be winning it like an 80%. Yeah, seriously. That's why, I mean, that's why the first five um, honestly is where my target is just because of, of those bullpens and and the craziness that can happen in those games. Um, let's jump ahead to another, uh, another Eastern division rivalry, another one of our top matchups of the day, but in the American league, the Toronto blue Jays versus the New York Yankees, 705 PM Eastern start time. We've got Yusei Kikuchi against Nestor Cortez jr. Yankees are minus minus one twenty two favorites. Blue Jays plus one Oh four The totals nine and a half. The blue Jays got the best of the Yankees in the first matchup of these AL East heavyweights last night with Alec Manoa shoving uh, Blue Jays bullpen, closing the door. 
Zerillo, what do you got on Blue Jays Yankees tonight? Yeah, all of our Blue Jays futures over the Yankees this year. Haven't bet on the Yankees yet, but we will be today. And I've generally found value so far going against the Blue Jays. I think the betting market is very high on them, but maybe a little bit too high. Nasty Nestor, the mustachioed maestro. We get to back him today. Absolutely love that guy. Uh, he seems super cool. Like he was just riding around on the A train and nobody recognized him. And then all of a sudden people started to identify who he was. And then he pitched for the Yankees. He's small. He doesn't crack 90 miles an hour basically with his fastball. So he's very deceptive but he is a weak contact fly ball pitcher and his, his strikeout minus walk rate. It's like 5% better than what you say Kikuchi offers. Kikuchi has had a weird career. His ERA was over five. I believe his first two years and the expected indicators were closer to four last year. His ERA was closer to four and the expected indicators were closer to five. He's very Jekyll and Hyde. He throws hard. It's like a mid nineties lefty, but he gives up a lot of hard contact when you hit him. And Cortez is kind of the opposite way, even though he has a better strikeout minus walk rate. Everything is in the air. It's a 50% fly ball rate, but it's all weak contact. So I still have some reservations about him in Yankee Stadium. There will be days where people are able to put the ball out multiple times against them. And going against the Blue Jays, that gives me some trepidation. But he had a 3-3 XERA last year. This kid is like super underrated in his stack ass metrics relative to what he's doing on the field. So I made the Yankees closer to minus 135 for the full game in the first five innings. I like this bet quite a bit, probably up to about minus 128 in either half. Yeah, it's kind of annoying how much the market loves the Blue Jays because I kind of thought that was going to be a team that we'd be able to, to find some value on early. I'm with you on liking the Yankees here. I'm a, I'm a big Nestor Cortez believer and Kikuchi kind of uh, scares me to bet on because you don't know what version of Kikuchi you're going to get. I... Where, where I'm targeting this game, though, just because you never know when the Blue Jays offense is going to just completely unload and put up six runs in an inning, is the Yankees team total here. Not the full game total, not the first five total, but the Yankees team total is um, over four and a half at minus 115, I feel like is a safe bet. The Blue Jays bullpen has been really good early on, but we saw them give up quite a few late runs to the Rangers opening weekend. They were great last night, um, but with no days off, I think that even if we get a good version of Kikuchi, the Yankees are going to be able to score win or lose. And again, if we get the bad version of Kikuchi, the team total over seems pretty safe bet at four and a half. My only concern with that and betting team totals with, with favorites at home is that you're probably not going to get the, the ninth inning for them. And yes. that's, I would look for the more team totals on the away team. Um, doesn't matter if they're, they're favored or, or the dog, but yeah, I just like getting that guaranteed sort of ninth inning. That's, that's like my one trepidation with team totals as opposed to game totals, but I have it at about 4.8. So I, I don't really disagree. Our last matchup of the day takes us out West with another divisional matchup, the San Diego Padres against the San Francisco Giants. The Padres pulled out a really tight win on Monday night, 9.45 p.m. Eastern West Coast start time. And it's a really intriguing pitching matchup with you Darvish getting his second start of the year against Alex Cobb, who got a lot of hype for his spring training, his velocity increase. Pretty close to a, a pick em on the board. Giants minus 106, Padres minus 110 with a total of seven and a half. Zerillo. Do you see value in this matchup on either side? No, no value on either side of the matchup. And I have the total at 7.8, so slightly into the over. But with the juice, nothing for me. Darvish's fly ball rate last year was a career high, 45%, 15% increase over the previous year. And he gave up a ton of home runs. Fly ball rate in his first start was 60%, obviously a small sample. But that's the thing to watch for him this year. If that fly ball rate is going to be north of... 35, 40%, he's going to keep giving up long balls. So that's going to be a problem because he's still a great pitcher, but no matter how good you are, if you're giving up the home run ball, it's hard to get your ERA below four for a season. Alex Cobb is the really interesting part of this matchup though. This guy's never thrown above 91.6 over a year in his career. He was touching 97 in spring training, which is absurd. I don't know what the Giants are doing. It feels like they're taking guys in, cloning them, and making them better versions of themselves and, and dumping the original body somewhere. So there's some sort of rejuvenation magic going on with the Giants. 
Uh, if you want to give me plus money, even I'll take minus 110 on the Giants having more wins while Fernando Tatis Jr. is in the league than the Padres do. I, I think that's where I'm at at this point. I love the direction that this Giants organization is heading, and I think they're doing smarter things than almost every other team. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's incredible, you know, what we saw them do last year with Tony Disco. What they what they did with Kevin Gaussman, um, even Rodon early this year, he looked electric. Yeah, like, Rodon looked electric. Um, the question is going to be, I mean, and this is part of the Giants' magic, I suppose. The question is going to be whether they're going to be able to keep him healthy or not. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really interested to see Cobb as well. This game's a stay away from me as well. Um, I'm I'm a Darvish believer. Like you mentioned, the the dingers. That's that's the biggest concern. Um, but he's going to get strikeouts regardless. I like betting his, I, I actually didn't look at the props market today, but I, I, I generally like to bet his over if it's not outlandish five and a half today, a heavily juiced five and a half minus five fifty might be worth a stab, but the giants have a, a really disciplined lineup and uh, but yeah, I, I, it's, it's funny. We've got you Darvish on the mound in a big division rivalry and, we're over here mostly talking about Alex Cobb. Alex Cobb, the guy who put up a 10.95 ERA for the Orioles a couple of years ago. He was he's caught in in a wasteland in Baltimore for several years. Um, but yeah, I'm really interested to see what the Giants do with him. Um, so let's move ahead. Um, those are our matchups of the day. We've got a couple other games we want to discuss. Sean, I'm going to start with you because you've got a couple of afternoon games you want to talk about, including an NL Central versus AL Central battle. We've got the Guardians against the Reds, a battle of aces, one you might know, one you might be less familiar with, Shane Bieber against Tyler Molly, 4.10 p.m. Eastern, first pitch. Zrillo, are you concerned about Bieber's spin rate? Yes, I'm betting against them here. And I'm concerned about the velocity as well. Injured last year, right around when MLB started cracking down on the tack. And it seems like Bieber might be a tack merchant. Came back in September, maybe October, uh, right at the end of the year through six innings. Velocity was down to 90 miles an hour, 91 miles an hour. And the spin rate on all of his pitches had dropped. First start of this year, velocity is still down to mid-91. And the spin rate still way, way down from his peak. So coming into the year, I was concerned with Bieber because last year he was rocking a 3.7x ERA, which was similar to his 2019 rate, 3.56. And in his Cy Young season, which was only 12 starts, so a limited sample, he was about a run better than that, but he was only facing the central teams, as Anthony DeBondo pointed out very well on our live show the other day. So facing weak teams... Short schedule, small sample, ERA was way better. That seems like the outlier. And then we come into the end of last year and start of this year, and his velocity is down two miles an hour from that Cy Young season. Actually, it's down more than that. It was, he was 94.2. Now he's down to 90.7. Curveball down from 83.7 to 81.7. So substantial drop in both pitches. And the spin rate being off as well is ultra concerning because of the sticky stuff. Now, Tyler Molly, we kind of know what he is, and we know that he's actually in the same range as where I'm projecting Bieber right now. All of his expected indicators last year between 3.7 and 3.8. I kind of have Bieber right now as a 3.7 pitcher. So very equal pitching matchup. I make the Reds a slight favorite. Got them at plus money last night. I think it's come down to a pick em, but I like the Reds here uh, quite a bit, and I like the over as well given those things with Bieber that, that are a bit concerning. I took a plus money eight and a half. I still like it at a flat eight. Um, yeah, Bieber is a, a pitcher to fade for me right now. Maybe, you know, he still has the command. He's, he's still solid. Like he still has skills where he could be a solid pitcher. I don't project him higher than I said about three, seven, five, but he is not that two, five pitcher who was during the Cy Young season. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Um, you can read more about the, the Bieber concerns as well on actionnetwork.com. Uh, you mentioned Anthony DeBundo. He wrote a, a betters notebook from the first weekend of the MLB season, touched on Bieber quite a bit in there. Um, Molly is insanely underrated as well. And Bieber is a pitcher that you're going to be able to successfully fade a lot this season, even if he's you know, 70 to 80% of what he was during his Cy Young season, the Guardians aren't going to be good. 
They put up a couple of crooked numbers over the weekend against the Royals, but that was the Royals. Now, granted, this is just the Reds, but Tyler Molly is a significantly better pitcher than anyone the Guardians faced early this year. Throwing out the early season sample sizes, I'm riding with the Reds. I think I got them at plus 100. I don't know, Sean, if that line has moved at all. Yeah, Reds, I mean, minus 110 range. Um, I would probably, I, I mean, I think they should be significantly favorite favored tonight so i'm i'm comfortable riding with the reds i liked it more plus money obviously uh i think it's actually come come to where my projection is i i had them as i had the game as basically a pick them and you were getting plus 110 last night and it flipped now it's now it's minus 110 so i think it's a fair number i don't see as much value in it as i did previously but that's why you have to follow me in the action network app and get my lines early overnight before the line moves. 2 a.m overnight for all the night if you're awake for it there. <laughs> Um, another afternoon game, another interesting one. We've got the Seattle Mariners against the Chicago White Sox, Chicago's home opener, 4.10 p.m. Eastern. A really intriguing young arm, Matt Brash, taking the mound against White Sox. Um, what do you want to call him? Injury replacement. Uh, journeyman Vince Velasquez. Sean, where are you going with this one? Yeah, I was just looking at our, our Action Labs pro- prop projections, and you mentioned you like the Darvish over. They have him, I believe it's 6.9 for today, so they they have the the juiced over 5.5 is an 8 out of 10. Matt Brash is a 10 out of 10 on our prop tool. They have him at 5.6 strikeouts. You can get plus money over 4.5, so I'm definitely going to be betting that as soon as we hang up on this podcast. I like Brash quite a bit. My projections have him just over 4 in terms of an expected ERA or FIP for the year. I projected this line at plus 103, so I still see value on the Mariners, like them down to about plus 110. Velasquez is kind of a low floor, low ceiling guy at this point. Never fulfilled his potential. Tons of stuff early in his career. He's not really, hasn't really lost a ton of velocity, but it's just never come together for him. Brash has all the upside in the world. 65 grade fastball and slider. So plus pitches, high spin fastball, throws upper 90s, 13 strikeouts per nine last season. Absolutely electric stuff. I don't know what his longevity is going to be if he is a long term starter. I think he's at worst a dominant fireman. So we'll, we'll see how he's able to develop as a starter. He's still young, but I definitely like the Mariners here. And I'm certainly going to be hitting that over on his strikeout prop. Yeah, I'm really excited to watch Brash. Speaking of Velasquez, though, and, and it's tough for me to avoid kind of drinking the, the Kool-Aid here a little bit, but we talked about the Giants and their success with pitchers recently. White Sox pitching coach Ethan Katz, a product of the Giants system, credited with the turnaround to Le- Lucas Giolito's career. He was Giolito's high school pitching coach. We saw what he did with Carlos Rodon. We've seen what he did with Dylan Cease. Velasquez 100% fits the mold of a pitcher that if Ethan Katz gets his hand on, we could see him live up to the potential that the Phillies tried to get him to reach for so long that we saw in San Diego for a short stint last year. Now, not every pitcher with a ton of potential is going to live up to that. Some of them, you know, it's just not there. Maybe they're not listening as well to to the corrections they can make. So I'm not going to sit here and say, yeah, Velasquez is in the White Sox system now. So he's going to immediately turn into a Cy Young contender like Rodon did under Katz last year, but he's someone interesting to watch. The problem with someone like Velasquez is that he plays on such a good team that you're not really going to be able to find value on his starts. You know, you're talking about a guy who is putting up ERAs with five and six in front of their name and he's sitting here with a minus 120 favorite tonight so that's kind of frustrating just from a better's perspective i'm staying away from this game personally but uh the brass strikeout total i mean more often than not if our action labs says a prop is 10 out of 10 i'm just going to blindly follow it because it's going to win more often than not colin i I have some concerns obviously at this point about the white Sox injuries i want to know from your perspective as a white Sox fan what's your finger on the pulse of how long they're not going to be at a hundred percent as a team and whether you think it might be worth it to take a future shot in the division against them right now. 
I'm less concerned with their pitching injuries than I guess most of White Sox Twitter would uh, would agree with. Giolito's only going to miss a start or two. It's not an arm injury. Sure, there, there is a little bit of concern about Lance in, given his age, given his body type. Um, but basically, the injury that, that we saw him go down with was a reemergence from something that he dealt with toward the end of last year. And it was something they knew were, was going to reemerge. And now he's having surgery that should hypothetically fully fix it. The White Sox might be fade worthy early on in 2022 because of their injuries. We're not going to see Yohan Mankata probably until the start of May. AJ Pollock, who knows with his hamstring strain, uh, it actually came at a time when he was going to go on leave for the birth of his child. So um, kind of convenient timing if there is such a thing for an injury. So I'm not willing to, I mean, if, if I'm going to look at futures markets in the AL central, it's because I think the twins are legit, not because I'm necessarily fading the white Sox. I think that's going to be a really tight and intriguing division race. I think you can still get the twins at like plus 500. I I mean, I like that before the season quite a bit. Yeah. I would absolutely take a stab on that, but I don't, I'm not, super concerned about the White Sox injury issues yet. We'll see. (laughs) Um, Let's move ahead. I've got a couple evening games I want to talk about, not necessarily because I see betting value on them tonight, but because they're going to inform betting opinions that we could potentially have down the road. The first one, Miami Marlins against the Los Angeles Angels, 707 PM Eastern. It's Jesus Luzardo against Patrick Sandoval. The reason I'm interested in this is just because I want to see what we're going to get out of Jesus Luzardo this year. I'm always really interested in seeing former top prospects who kind of went through tough times and to see if they've made the improvements worthwhile to make them steady rotation members long-term. Luzardo had a 6.61 ERA last year. But that was a little bit unlucky. He had a 4.84 xFIP. The issue was that his fastball got absolutely crushed. His slider was still pretty good. Now, Patrick Sandoval is one of my favorite buys in baseball this year. I think the Angels have an absolute stud there. The Angels are minus 162. Marlins are plus 136, and the total's nine there. I don't see any betting value here necessarily, but these are two of my favorite young pitchers. Luzardo, again, a good buy low candidate, whether it's in fantasy, whether it's in betting, if he looks good today. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on him in particular and Sandoval to see if he lives up to the promise that we saw in him last year. Sean, I don't know what you think. I mean, I I had to bet my guy Luzardo here. If you followed me for any bit of time, you know that I am very high on the baby lizard. Obviously was concerned last year. I thought this guy had Cy Young potential when he was coming up. He was the best pitching prospect I watched in the minor leagues over a two-year period. Don't completely know what happened because it's not like his velocity fell off. He seemingly lost shape on his pitches and completely lost his command, but also, I mean, his walk rate doubled, but the home run ball got out of control. And it seemed like it was more of a pitch sequencing issue than anything else. He lost confidence in his breaking ball and his changeup. And when he fell behind in counts, he got very fastball heavy and it became predictable. And he got mashed in two Oh three, one counts on the fastball. So perhaps it's a game planning issue that they can slightly correct over his last eight starts in Miami. Once he settled in there, his expected indicators dropped to about 4.3. And if he can stay there, that's fine. I don't need him to be a Cy Young guy in order to bet on him. I just need him to be a run better than what he was last year. His command was better this spring. It's a limited sample. It's hard to take much away from spring training stats. If I'm going to take anything away from a limited sample of spring training stats, it's strikeout and walk numbers. So I think, and I project him to be closer to what he was at the end of last year, which was that, that 4.3 expected fit pitcher. Now, Sandoval is a very underrated guy, I think. 3-5 expected ERA last year. Young, tons of potential. And I think if he has a lot of success, the Angels could definitely take a step forward this year. But I do project value on the Marlins. I made them 130. or they're, they're, Yeah, I made them about 135 for the game. I got a number closer to plus 150. I wouldn't really bet it below plus 140. But 
I saw enough from Lizardo last, end of last year and into the spring that I think it's okay to bet on him today. God, if the Marlins hit on Lizardo, that future rotation is just going to be absolutely sick. I mean, in, until they trade them all, I guess, because they get too expensive in arbitration. They're just going to let, you know, they, they're all stacked on a, basically every, every year, two of them expire, all these contracts that they have coming up. So hopefully they don't just let them leave or like you said, flip them with a year and a half left, but they are pretty stacked up. They've got about seven or eight high upside starters that they can yeah. roll out over the next a lot two years. That, have, that are already there, a lot that are on the way. Sixto Sanchez on the mend. It's, it's wild. Um, the last game that we're going to talk about today before we get to our best bets of the day is a, a matchup of heavyweights and, and one I wanted to target only because of specifically because of the pitching matchup. We have the Los Angeles Dodgers against the Minnesota Twins opening a series in the Twin City, 7.40 p.m. Eastern. The Dodgers are minus 134, Twins plus 114, with a total of 9.5. The reason this game is so interesting to me is because the pitching matchup is bad and and that it's that's not something that you would say from about a with with teams of this quality this is the question mark spot in the rotation for two contenders Andrew Heaney against Chris Archer Heaney went last year from the Angels to the Yankees via trade and was absolutely abysmal for the Bronx Bombers down the stretch I'm not even sure if he made the Playoff roster in the wild card game. I, I I could be mistaken about that. He had a 5.83 ERA and a 4.12 xFIP in all last year. And Archer's entering the season healthy for the first time in a long time. So this total is high. I think it's high for a reason. Both of these teams have pretty good bullpens, but I'm kind of leaning over here just because I don't know what we're going to get out of Heaney and Archer. Now we've talked about teams that are really good at getting the most out of pitchers. The Dodgers are certainly up there. Heaney kind of fits that mold. He was a guy who, I mean, I think he's probably 30 or older now. And I feel like for a decade, we were saying, well, this is the year Heaney's going to break out with the angels. Um, and now he's, he's in a competent organization for developing pitchers. Now, I don't want people to take this as me saying to bet this. But if you look at where Robbie Ray was at the start of last year, off of the odds board in most places for Cy Young, a guy who had a ton of promise, a guy in his upper 20s, early 30s, who figured it all out. If I would have said to you a year ago today, bet Robbie Ray for Cy Young, you would have laughed at me and he won the dang Cy Young. I'm not saying to bet Andrew Heaney for Cy Young. I'm just saying this guy has had a world of promise for a long time. He's now a legitimate veteran pitcher going to a team that gets the most out of his starting pitchers. I just want to keep an eye on Andrew Heaney as a Dodger, but I don't know what you think about this game in general, Zerillo. I think the fact that the Dodgers signed him is reason enough to be interested. They're not going to sign somebody who they don't see potential in. He's just always been a guy who's underachieved relative to his expected metrics. It's always been closer to four and he's career ERA is 4.7. There always seems to be one or two pitchers, I guess, per generation, whatever you want to call it, of baseball players who just, they, they have those expected metrics that they just never live up to. Ricky Nolasco is always the name that stands out in my mind. That guy always had expected indicators about a rung lower than where his actual ERA fell. Yeah. And at some point you have to accept this guy doesn't fit the mold of everybody else. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Um, yeah. This game screams over from a pitching standpoint. Like yeah. screams over. And I had the total projected at 5.5 for the first five innings and 9.7 for the goal game. So I bet the overs. My one concern that I'm just realizing, the wind is blowing in in target field today. Uh, we have an action lab system, weather wind blowing in, that it fits currently, that it has an 8.9% ROI since 2005, I believe, that our system goes back. At target field, that system, though, is 23 and 29. So given the dimensions of the park, I'm not really sure if it fits. Small sample there compared to, uh, you know, 1,500 bets all time that that fits. Archer's velocity was up in spring training, coming back off of an injury. 
I don't know if he's going to be able to sustain. He's dealt with arm injuries the past two years. He may be able to carry that velocity for an inning or two. I don't see that holding up. So ugh, I have major concerns about both of these pitchers. I know the wind is blowing in. This is, this is just such an obvious over game for me, not only in terms of looking at it on paper, but in terms of my projection that it's spitting out. I, yeah. I think you just kind of blind bet the over here. Yeah. And, and the reason I wanted to, to, to pinpoint this game is mostly because, because the pitching matchup is so questionable. This is such a big question mark spot for in the rotation of two contending teams where I really want to see how Heaney and Archer looks, because if either of them are able to bring even some level of competence that changes the outlook Dodgers from probably more of a world series perspective and the twins, as we mentioned earlier, for an opportunity to, to catch the white Sox in the AL central. Before we wrap up, want to get our best bets for tonight's slate. Zerillo, I'll start with you. What's your best bet for tonight? Yeah, it would have been the Reds. If you could still get plus money on their first five line, I love that bet going against Bieber. But on the projections, my biggest edge by far today is the Yankees. So we're going to take Nestor Cortez Jr. against Yusei Kikuchi. I like either of those lines. I just want to find my price targets up to minus 128. So either first five and full game, I'm basically betting both halves, not a unit on both half, but to win a unit and either to win a half unit in either half. Um, I just see a pretty substantial difference in my projection between these two starting pitchers. I'm going to go out West for my best bet. I'm looking at Astros Diamondbacks Astros minus 150 full game money line is my favorite bet. Now it's kind of funny. We we've talked on other podcasts about how often we bet on the Diamondbacks as underdogs last year and how often it came back to bite us. We've got Luis Garcia against Madison Bumgarner today. And I am, I'm going to be fading Bumgarner into oblivion, especially in the right spots. The Astros only have 43 plate appearances against lefties this year. So far, it's a small sample size. You can ignore the numbers. They were the best offense in baseball against lefties last year with a 117 weighted runs created. Plus, yes, they lost Carlos Correa in the offseason, but they still have plenty of ma lefty mashers in the lineup, including guys with reverse splits like Jordan Alvarez. Of course, they still have Bregman. They still have Michael Brantley. They still have Altuve. Uh, Kyle Tucker started the year really hot. Astros are minus 150 is, you know, a decent amount of juice, but I feel like against Bumgarner and with Luis Garcia, who's insanely underrated rookie of the year candidate last year, I or did he win it? I don't, I guess I don't remember, uh, but a supremely underrated young pitcher and with a old fade worthy lefty on the mound, I think Astros should be much bigger favorites than minus 150. So that's my favorite bet of the day. I believe Luis finished second to a Rosarena. Right. Um, he was, I mean, pitchers, it feels like kind of struggle to win the award. It always seems like they're, they're the favorite live in season. And then a hitter ends up passing them late. You already know I'm on the diamondbacks on the other side, obviously uh, the Astros have been the best team hitting lefties for almost a three or four year period at this point. It's getting kind of ridiculous. I know they've had some lineup turnover, but yeah, they match lefties as a team. I just, I made this line closer to plus 130, so I had to take a shot of the D-backs, but I, I totally get the reasoning. You just can't quit the snake, Zerillo. <laughs> Going to be the death of me, Colin. That'll do it for us. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff. And as a reminder, we'll be coming to you every Tuesday and Friday during the Major League Baseball season to break down that day's slate. This has been Payoff Pitch. I'm Colin Whitchurch. That's Sean Zerillo. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.